I waited till I was over 60 years old for my first experience of walking across the sands to Peel Island. Better late in life than never, I suppose. It was beautiful. About an hour after our return to Snab Point on Walney, the tide was already covering the sands across which we had walked. I am one of many thousands of people over the years who would say that this is one of their favourite places in the world. The setting of Peel and Row is magnificent, lying within the sites of special scientific interest of Morecambe Bay and the South Walney and Peel Channel Flats. These sites of interest are conservation areas of natural beauty, valued for their wildlife, flora, fauna and landscape. The South Walney Nature Reserve, looked after by the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, is a fantastic place for walking, bird watching and for stunning views of Morecambe Bay. This South Walney Spit is the main haul out site for grey seals in the northwest of England, and live seal webcams at the Cumbria Wildlife Trust website give a glimpse of these beautiful animals. The islands of Peel and Row sit on either side of the deep water entrance to the safe harbour of Walney Channel, which gives refuge from the strong tides and shallow waters of the Irish Sea and Morecambe Bay. There is something timelessly romantic about this view. The silhouette of a ruined castle on a small island. A castle built not for war, but by monks of Furness Abbey as a stronghold from which to trade across the Irish Sea. No doubt this view also appeals to childhood memories for people of a certain age who can remember reading these books as children. In 1127, Peel, then known as Faldry Island, was given to the Sevignac monks of Furness Abbey as part of their original land grant from Stephen of Blois, later King of England. In 1212, King John granted the abbey a license to land provisions on the island after the failure of the local harvest. And later in the century, an unlimited cargo license was granted. By 1258, ships owned by the abbey were placed under royal protection. In the early 13th century, the Cistercian monks of Furness Abbey built a warehouse on Peel for the storage of grain, wine and wool as the trade from Peel to abbey lands in Ireland increased. In 1327, the abbey was granted the right to fortify this warehouse in stone and to make a Motton Bailey Fort, also known as a Peel, which is the castle that we see today. This was intended to repel pirates and raiders and also perhaps to keep the customs men at bay. Smuggling was widespread at the time, and in 1423 an accusation was even made against the abbot of Furness that he smuggled wool out of the country from Faldre. I suspect it was probably a true accusation. The Ship Inn is believed to have been a former ship's chandlery established on the island in the 17th century. In 1746, a lease for agricultural land situated within the Castle Ditch was granted to an Edward Postlethwaite, who is described as the innkeeper from the Pile of Foudry. By the 19th century, the tradition of crowning the King of Peel had become an established tradition to such an extent that responsibility for looking after the helmet and the chair fell within the tenancy agreement. 
the ceremony is said to be a slightly mocking homage to the story of Lambert Simnel. On the 4th of June 1487, a rebellious army landed here intending to claim that the ten-year-old Lambert was heir to the throne, which had been lost by the Yorkists at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. The Yorkists had support in Ireland, and in May 1487, the rebels had young Lambert crowned as King Edward VI of England in Dublin, and Peel was chosen as their landing place in England, partly because it was near the lands of Sir Thomas Broughton, one of the rebels' few English allies. Surprisingly, or perhaps not so surprisingly, there is no record of resistance to the landings on Peel. So perhaps the Abbey, which by now had rich trade contacts in Ireland, was in on the plan, and turned a blind, bribed eye in advance. The Boy King's Yorkist and mercenary force of about 8,000 men must have filled the island to overflowing. But they did not stay long. Just 12 days after their landing, they were defeated by King Henry's much larger army at Stoke Field near Newark, the final battle of the Wars of the Roses. Lambert, rightly judged as an innocent child, was forgiven and put to work as a scullion in the royal kitchens. He later became a falconer, living on well into the reign of Henry VIII. After all, he'd never been king of anywhere but Peel. After the dissolution of the monasteries, Peel continued as the main harbour for the area, and by the 18th century was recognised with the provision of a custom house in 1720 and the first Walney Lighthouse in 1790. From 1745, local iron ore was exported from the tidal Barrow Channel between Barrow Island and the mainland along the present strand. The Newland Company built the first jetty in the Barrow Channel between Barrow Island and the mainland in 1790. As the volume of shipping increased, harbour pilots and customs inspectors were stationed on Peel, and in 1875 a row of cottages was constructed for them by the Duke of Buccleuch. A salt works is recorded as existing on Peel from as early as 1662, long before salt was discovered on South Walney in 1887. Production began in earnest on Walney during the mid-1890s with the construction of a works that included an evaporating plant with six chimneys and 24 pans. Walney's South Pier was constructed in the 1870s for exporting from the Walney gravel workings. By using this pier to load salt, the Barrow Salt Company avoided paying any dues to the Port Authority of Barrow. In 1840, John Abel Smith, a London banker, bought Row Island hoping to develop a harbour company. He built a causeway to the mainland, completed in 1846, and also an 810-foot deep water pier, known as Peel Pier, from where steamers sailed to Fleetwood. This pier extended far out into the channel from the site of the present boat club. In 1846, the Furness Railway completed its first rail track to transport slate from Kirby to Roe Island. On the 24th of August 1846, a passenger service also began. Peel Railway Station was the terminus of this branch and was built to serve the passenger steamers at Peel Pier. The Roe Island Hotel, which was built next to the station, survives as a Grade 2 listed building. By 1848, the Furness Railway had the steamer Helvellyn on the Fleetwood service and the Zephyr on the Liverpool service, both sailing out of Peel. Roe Island's Customs House Tower was completed by 1849 and was designed as a lookout post for customs and excise officials. In 1852, the Furness Railway agreed to buy the lease for the entire Roe Island estate from John Smith. But before the deal could be completed, a freak storm caused damage to the pier. This allowed the railway to buy all the rights and the property for only £15,000. In 1867, the Fleetwood Steamer Service moved to Barrow with the opening of the first docks. 
Peel Pier, though, continued in use for the Belfast and Isle of Man services run by the Barrow Steam Navigation Company until 1881, when the Ramsden Dock Station was built and the services moved to Barrow. Peel Pier was finally dismantled in 1894, but the railway continued in use until July 1936. The Barrow Fleetwood Steamer Service, which had ceased in 1870, was restarted at the turn of the century due to the popularity of Blackpool as a holiday resort, and steamers such as the Lady Evelyn and the Lady Moira were very popular. Peel Island fell under the complete ownership of the Duke of Buccleuch in 1874 and he spent a considerable sum on maintenance of the crumbling castle buildings. In 1919 the Duke finally decided to sell the island but the intervention of the Mayor of Barrow, Alfred Barrow, in August 1919 halted the sale. He requested that the island be given to the town and so in 1920 Peel was given to the borough as a memorial to those who lost their lives during the First World War. So, on my first experience of walking across the sands to Peel, I was walking back into almost 900 years of history. But news reports in early 2020 suggest that there is a story here which goes back much, much further than this. A hoard of 21 Roman coins dating from AD 70 to AD 171 was discovered on farmland at Ramside in 2019. No firm evidence of Roman settlement has yet been discovered in Lower Furness, but they must surely have sailed our coastline. The Dock Museum website suggests that there may have been a naval signal station to help guide sea traffic between Lancaster and Ravenglass, with possible sites at Aldingham, Peel or South Walney. But these probably wooden structures would have decayed and been swept away by coastal erosion. So perhaps in the context of the wider history of Morecambe Bay and the Irish Sea, the story of this deep water safe harbour at Peel does indeed go back much further in time than we've seen so far. Hmm, interesting. <laughs>